Hello and welcome to Talking Tudors, a fortnightly podcast about the ever-fascinating Tudor dynasty. My name is Natalie Gruniger and I'll be your host and guide on this journey through 16th century England. Are you ready to step through the veil of time into the dazzling and dangerous world of the Tudor court? Without further ado, it's time to talk Tudors. everyone, welcome to Talking Tudors episode 162. I'm your host Natalie Gruniger and I'm so thrilled that you could join me. I'd like to start by acknowledging and thanking the wonderful listeners who continue to support this podcast via Podbean Patron and extend a heartfelt thank you to everyone who's taken the time to rate and review the show. This really makes a big difference. If you love the podcast and you never miss an episode, perhaps you'd consider becoming a Talking Tudors patron. Just click on the Be My Patron on Podbean badge on the homepage of my website, www.onthetudortrail.com, or click on the Be a Patron button on the Podbean app. Join the Talking Tudors patron family, and in addition to receiving lots of Tudor-themed goodies, you'll be automatically entered into our patron-only monthly giveaways. June's prize is a book bundle containing the three novels in Tony Rich's Elizabethan series. A huge thank you to the author for sponsoring this wonderful prize. All patrons are also eligible to attend monthly Talking Tudors live talks, which take place on Zoom. These events are exclusive to patrons. Next weekend, I'll be chatting to Brooke Little about the musical lives of the Tudor Queen's consort. Please get in touch with me if you'd like to register for this event. You can also support the podcast and share your love of Tudor history with the world by buying Talking Tudors merchandise. There are a number of designs and products available, including phone cases, mugs, notebooks and apparel. Check out all the products at talkingtudors.threadless.com. I would absolutely love to see pics of you wearing or using your Talking Tudors merch, so please do tag me on social media and use the hashtag #ILoveTalkingTudors. Now let's get on to today's episode. I'm so thrilled that joining me on the show to talk about Elizabeth I and Catherine de' Medici is Dr. Estelle Peronc. Dr. Peronc is Assistant Professor in History at New College of the Humanities at Northeastern. She has published extensively on Elizabeth I and the Valois. Estelle has appeared in BBC Two, The Berlin's A Scandalous Family and Secrets d'Histoire, episodes on Elizabeth I and Mary I. Her work has been featured in The Telegraph, The Times and BBC History magazine. She's participated in numerous podcasts. She's the author of Elizabeth I of England through Valois Eyes by Palgrave Macmillan 2019 and Blood, Fire and Gold, the story of Elizabeth I and Catherine de' Medici, published by Ebury Publishing and forthcoming on the 30th of June 2022. My conversation with Estelle straight after this musical break, courtesy of singer-songwriter Carleen. The song Firing Gold is from Carleen's album Elizabeth.
Estelle, welcome back to Talking Tudors. How are you? Hi, Natalie. Thank you so much for having me again. It's always a pleasure to be talking to you. I'm doing very well. Thank you very much. Oh, fantastic. And I I love uh, chatting to you. That's why I keep asking you back to the show. (laughs) Now, it has been a little while since we last talked on the podcast, and we've had lots of new listeners find the show, which is fantastic. So would you mind just introducing yourself again to our listeners and just telling us a little bit about you and your background? Yeah, sure. So um, I'm Dr. Estelle Paronc, and uh, I'm an assistant professor in history at the New College of Humanities at Northeastern, which is part of North Northeastern University Global Network. I work in London. Uh, I'm in the UK right now. And uh, yes, I am specialized in early modern queenship. I've published extensively on Elizabeth I. She's the reason why I do all I'm doing, really. Uh, and, and because she was not perfect. That's, I think that, you know, some people think, oh, but you think she was perfect. No, I, I know I know she was not. I think I love her so much because she was not perfect. Uh, I don't like perfection that much. <laughs> I think it's boring. Anyway, so yes, that's what I do. And I'm, I'm interested in, you know, other types of history as well the memory of history like that's why I did remembering queens and kings so it's it was an edited collection an academic edited collection and yes and I also also obviously love French history especially when it's intertwined with Tudor history so more to come on this but obviously it is a big topic for me it's something that I absolutely love and creating or revealing these stories to a public is what really interests me Fantastic. And and there's lots that we could talk about, but we are actually here to talk about your new book. And I'm so excited and eagerly awaiting my copy to arrive, which is called Blood, Fire and Gold, the story of Elizabeth I and Catherine de' Medici, which is coming out. It will be published on the 30th of June. So tell us a little bit about why you decided to write a joint biography of these two quite amazing 16th century women. Yeah, I mean, I'm so excited about this book. Uh, This book has been on my mind for five years oh my god it's been that long yes five years so basically what happened is that I did a PhD on Elizabeth and the French uh, monarchs and it has been translated into a book obviously I published a book on this which is Elizabeth the first of England through Valois eyes it's an academic book so it's not I would say that some people can be put off by it because it's um it's not a story it's really like making a point my point is the importance of Anglo-French relations under Elizabeth's reign and that we we have overlooked the relationship with Charles IX and Henry III. But by doing that research, what was really clear to me is that obviously there was this very important third player. And while in my first book on Elizabeth through Valois eyes, I minimized Catherine's input because my point was we're overlooking Charles and Henry, who were kings and in charge of their countries. Well, we can debate that. And so... I realized that I had lots of materials that were not going to go into that book. I also realized that Elizabeth and Catherine were basically ruling during the second half of the 16th century. 
for 30 years, they were ruling, you know, when I say together, I mean, like, at the same time. And some people can argue, yeah, but Catherine is not queen regnant. It's true. But Catherine is going to reinvent queenship. She's going to reinvent power through motherhood. So I was thinking, oh, my God, the true rival to Elizabeth is someone who was actually in charge or participating to be in charge of a country, who had strong political agency. What I'm saying is that not just someone who was a prisoner in castle in the north of England, like Mary Stuart, for 18 years. Catherine was never a prisoner. Catherine was in Privy Council. She was at the French court. She was making decisions. She was advising her sons. And at some point, she was even the one you know, from 1560 to 1563, she's the one making the decisions, calling the shots. And I would even argue that even after that, even when Charles became, you know, a king and like in his own right and he's ruling in his own right in 1563 is of age, he's still going to say, my mom is still in charge, oh, not my mom, but my mother is still in charge of the country and I'm still going to listen to her. And the truth is, all the policies, all the ideas are from Catherine, at least until 1567, I'd say. Then Charles is starting saying, actually you know he's growing he's growing into a young man he's no longer a young teenager he's yes he's on mind and he's like actually i would like to have my say and then it's it's a more joint kind of rulership so i was like okay i can't put all of this in one book it would be like 500 pages and we would be lost by all the different dynamics so in 2017 i was like i finished you know that book it was going to be published in 2018, end of 2018. And I was like, okay, I need to write a book on Elizabeth and Catherine. But that time, I didn't want it to be an academic book. That time, I wanted to reach out to a bigger audience. I want to share my passion, my knowledge, my expertise, my years in archives, my passion for manuscripts with a bigger audience. I want to show people that there's more than Elizabeth and Mary Stuart or Elizabeth and Mary the First. I want to show that as another very important political player. And that woman was Catherine de Medici. So it's a joint biography because at first, the first part of the book is really about the education, how they were raised. You see them, it's, it's called the making of queens because none of them were born to be queens and they rose to power. And it's absolutely mind-blowing to see them uh, to, to look at all these facts, to look at all their letters, to look at what's happening and how between 1558, 1560, fate was striking and changing, you know, ch changing history, making two women very much in power, which is absolutely amazing. And then it's really about the rest of the book is really, it, it's not a biography like saying, you know, all these dates, it's here what happens and hear what happens and hear what happens it's the dynamic of their relationships it's to show the importance of their relationship when you want to understand early modern politics when you want to, to understand elizabethan politics you cannot remove catherine she's not just a villain she's not just this awful woman she's actually much more than that and she has influenced elizabeth in many ways and elizabeth has influenced her so that's that's the what the book is about. It sounds absolutely amazing. Um, I, I absolutely can't wait to read it. And I'm so glad that you you have made this, like you said, for a, a wider audience. I think that's really important. Before we look closer at that relationship that you've been talking about, let's just take a, a closer look at Catherine. This is obviously talking Tudors. So, you know, I'm sure my <laughs> listeners are very familiar with Elizabeth and her kind of backstory. But would you mind telling us a little bit about Catherine's family and background? Yeah, I would love to. So Catherine is obviously, you know, well, when you see the Tudors, like the Tudor period is like, obviously, you know, you think about England, but it's also like what's happening on the continent. So Catherine is a, is a very important part of what's happening on the continent. Catherine is a daughter of Lorenzo II of Medici from a very powerful noble house. You know, the Medici were very, very strong, very, very powerful. And she's the daughter of Lorenzo and Madeleine de la Tour d'Auvergne, who's also from a very powerful, established French noble house what's very interesting is that Catherine is not just Italian and I'm going to take her back I'm going to take I'm, I'm the uh, French side of me it's going to be like wait a minute that woman was half French half Italian you know that's, but she's going to be born in Italy obviously the tragedy with Catherine is that she's going to lose both her parents within weeks of her birth her, her mother and then her father her mother is uh, it's from complications after childbirth and her mother uh, and her father is going to be a 
through war at Albino. So like her father is going to fight for, you know, for his territory and he's going to, he's going to lose. So she's an orphan. The first month of her, ha- of, of her life, she's an orphan. It was crazy is that the alliance between the Medici and the La Tour d'Auvergne should have been a very important dynastic alliance that would have brought very much together France and Italy. And here, it was a bit torn apart. We just have this little girl left. She's the product of that. Then she spent lots of time with many relatives, so her aunties, her grandmother, but they're all going to die. And then she's going to spend some time with her uh, uncle who's Pope, the Pope. And she then became a real pawn in politics. There's a war. There's the Italian wars. It's a war between, obviously, Charles, you know, and, well, first it's going to start before that, but it's, it's a war between Spain, between France, between um, different Italian territories. And it's about who you're going to get control of some territories in Italy. And for Francis, he sees Catherine as a way of getting closer to the Pope. And he offered his second son, not the first one, the second son, Henry, Henry, Duke of Orléans. And in, 15, in October 1533, they're going to get married in Marseille. They're both 13. They meet each other and Catherine it's almost like I mean I wasn't there but it's almost love at first sight she's very infatuated with this with this young teenager and Henry is not Henry is very much already in love with a 17 20 year old older woman uh, Diane de Poitiers who was his tutor and who apparently taught him more than books and languages and education and everything like that. She, she wouldn't really, you know, she took this very, very seriously, if you see what I mean. Anyway. I think I do. I think I do. <laughs> <laughs> and then we have Catherine, who uh, was in France with no relatives anymore. Obviously, the Pope took her there and he went back and to the Vatican and, and she was in France with some ladies in waiting that were Italian. She was massively criticized for speaking Italian. She's going to learn French really quickly. She's extremely smart. But everyone is kind of looking down on her. What really importance does she have? Not much. And she's going to develop almost a father-daughter relationship with Francis I, who's going to really like her because she's actually he's going to to see her for who she was. She's really smart. She's really talented. But she hides it. She's like very obedient, very humble very modest she's not the woman she's going to become you know when she's going to reveal a new a new way a new personality and and during that time she's going to suffer from a lot of humiliation her husband is completely you know ignoring her um there are discussions of a divorce because they are they can't have children together and the reason why they can't have children is not because of fertility issues it's because actually he's not doing things right with her and um, when they became Dauphin Dauphine of France because Henry's older brother is going to die and actually there are rumors that it was Catherine who uh, you know plotted that to become princess it's absolutely nonsense at all because that's not like it's really not in Catherine's mindset of you know she doesn't even think of power at that time she it's so far away all she's thinking about survival and it's the same with elizabeth you know they share so much in yes. terms of their education and the way that, they were yeah. yeah and the way they were raised that's why it struck me that there that there was no work on those two queens on these two women who suffered so much during the you know the first part of their lives and so uh catherine and henry are going to have children because the under is going to help the couple what I mean by that, please read my book it's in more details. Yes. But, uh, what I mean by that is um, she prepares Henry until he's ready and then he transfers to Catherine. So can you imagine the <laughs> humiliation oh, that it must have been for, for Catherine? And, uh, but it's going to work. They're going to have children together. And through her children, this is when she realizes how much power she can have. But it's also what I think what really touched me as well is that to imagine that orphan who lost so many relatives was then sent to another country in a foreign language in you know i mean of course like you know she she learned french and so she was well educated but you know she was not fluent and all these type of things and, and obviously she became fluent quite quickly but still what i'm saying is that the cultural change the fact that she was in many ways again abandoned by her uncle you know you could see it that way you know like you, you you're given to 
another man and his son is, and you're 13 and you have absolutely no one in the world to protect you anymore. Even if she has Francis in many ways, like she can't be 100% sure that Francis will always have her back. But then she has children. And then you have this motherhood that is taking over her. And that is so important and significant for her. And what she realizes, I'm now the mother of a future king. And this is where power and the interest in power is growing. So that's how Catherine. <laughs> and so fascinating. And there's lots of things that struck me while you were speaking. But I suppose one of those things is I remember you and I chatting about Elizabeth in another episode that we did. And you were saying how Elizabeth in the early days also didn't show her kind of true colours. And so the, yeah. those things that they had in common, obviously there were things that were very different too, but those things they had in common are, are really fascinating. So interesting. So you've told us a little bit, obviously, how she enters the, the French royal family through through marriage. And you've touched on that the fact that their relationship was not, I don't know, it was not very good, I suppose. Did you want to say anything more about Catherine's marriage at all, about how their relationship worked? Well, so we obviously what's... there's a third person in the relationship. It is definitely ménage à trois. Yeah. Um, Diane is the, is the queen in all but name. She's the one in the Privy Council. She's the one advising the king. She's the one who is always by his side. And Catherine is always in the background. What's interesting, though, and a bit sad, is that toward the end of Henry II's reign, so he's going to die in July 1559. And what's interesting is that towards, I would say, the last five years, so when he turns 35, and Catherine and him, he's starting to realise that his wife is actually very intelligent. So he's going to make a regent when he goes to, well, co-regent with a with a council. And so it's going to drive Diane completely nuts. Like, she's going to go, why are you doing that? Like, you. Um, and he's going to realise that she actually makes good decisions. And there's actually one moment in, in my book where Catherine's role is decisive in getting back Kelly. Please read about this because it's absolutely fantastic what she's done. Uh, she She's the reason why France got Kelly back. I think because she's been so vilified, we don't, you know, um, yeah. see that. We don't talk about this. And, and unfortunately, Henry is going to die when he's 40 years old. But, you know, and his death is, is a tragedy. I mean, Catherine is the one screaming, is the one we have records of her rushing at his side. It's in a tournament. He's going to get like a lens in his eyes. He's going to die away after 10 days of agony. But she's the one screaming. She's the one asking for Ambroise Paris, the the surgeon of France. He's the father of surgery, probably. And 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 all of this. But at the same time, so it's a tragedy. She she's she becomes a widow. She she's mourning. She will mourn all her life. She's wearing black and white for the rest of her life, you know, like well, mostly black. But at the same time, his death brought glory. It's when everything changed for Catherine. Not right away, because Francis II became king with Mary Stuart as Queen of France. And that was not a nice period of for her, but she was still like starting to have. Uh, some she could give political advice to to her son but obviously he's gonna die as well in 1560 in december 1560 and then it's her nine-year-old boy charles who's gonna become king and then that is it that is it that's when catherine is revealing that she's not just that humble obedient modest why well, it's the same with elizabeth right it's what we discussed in this other yeah. episode we have a the masks are, are gonna fall and gonna be <laughs> You thought I was that that easy going. Well, <laughs> you're cute. No, I wasn't. Yes, that was it. Like that was the political games. Uh, because Catherine and Elizabeth have in themselves the fear of losing everything. They are on survival mode for so many years that they have to hide their dreams, their desires, their ambitions, if they had any. They could not share them, right? Like yeah. they, they were not allowed. But then 1558 for Elizabeth, 1560 for Catherine. Oh, boom, bada boom. We have the real two women who are like, Elizabeth is telling everyone, don't tell me what to do. Catherine is telling everyone, don't tell me what to do. I'm not a mother of a king. And she actually, she does more than that. Instead of becoming mother of the king that Wiz of Savoy used with Francis I, and instead of using Queen Dowager, that was the formal title for a concert that, you know, when the husband had died. She said, oh, I'm not, I'm none of these. I am Queen Mother. Queen Mother of France is created by Catherine. And the importance of this is you have mother, a mother is in charge of her children. So you have already 
power through the term mother, but she added queen, queen mother. She's not just any mother. She's a queen mother. She's, you know, so she, but she really gets her power through motherhood, but she makes it to another level. She, she takes it to another level where it's even stronger and it's going to be much harder to take her down. And actually, and actually you can't, you can't, no one took her down. That's quite a safe position, isn't it? Queen mother, absolutely. And so you you mentioned that Catherine's husband, the 40-year-old Henry II, dies in a jousting accident. And I read some really interesting things about the effort that was made to actually save his life. Can you tell us a little bit more about that uh, kind of time period? Honestly, I have, yeah, I can, I, I can talk about this. I think I've written three pages on this because we have Ambroise Paré. So Ambroise Paré is a remarkable man. Like he's, there's so much um, about the way he was, his education, the way he went through. He was fascinated by natural science, natural philosophy. You know, I don't, I want to say medicine, but it's very early. But he's very interested in, in you know, in the bodies and how you can recover. So what's going to happen is that, as I said, he's hurt in his eye. Henry II has a massive wound and, um, and he's still alive. But he's in absolutely agony. And so Catherine knows that the only man who can save Henry, if it is at all possible, it's going to be Ambroise Paris. So he's going to be called and he's going to be asked to save him. And he's not sure. He's never seen that type of wound. So then there's something, there's a story. It's all, it's all very descriptive. And, and actually, it's a gory part of my book. And I don't do gory. Uh, <laughs> but but I do. he basically is going to ask for four prisoners from La Bastille and and they need to be alive they can't be dead because he needs to replicate exactly what happened so they he's gonna he's gonna basically pierce their eyes and see if and in the exact same way it has to be so he at first the two first he, he really missed them like he it's not it's not good to see it's not the exact same you know duplicate of what happened to Henry so he has to do it again so with the third one and and Catherine's like you can have many more if you if you need to like she's completely you know crazy it's so funny because when I saw that source of like someone who witnessed all of this I was like that's gonna be perfect for me to recreate that scene to recreate like to put the readers in the moment it's what I try to do it's it's written like a novel it's all based on primary evidence there's nothing that I've invented that you know everything has been written in a primary source but it was I was like boy I love that person because I was like I'm so grateful I can recreate that scene completely thanks to to their notes and so yes and at the end he's going to manage to get one guy with the exact same wound and he's going to try to save that person and then he turns to, to Catherine and he says I can't I can't do it and he couldn't. And then Henry II is going to die after 10 days of agony. And what's so sad as well is that obviously he's 40 years old. He was at the peak of his strength. He's a brilliant warrior king. He's getting closer to his wife, not on a romantic level, but on a partnership level. They're starting to understand each other. Maybe he gets tired of, of Diane. I don't know. I don't, you know, but she's 60 or about to be 60. So maybe like there's less interest. But the, the relationship is not really, it's not about sex. It's really, there's something else. It's probably love. I mean, I don't know what it is, but there, there's some, is mistresses, it's never just about sex. I've, I've written an article on this uh, for BBC. But yes, because it's, it's very much, there's very much more. But what's very interesting is, well, very sad. The tragedy is that he obviously leaves his wife with his children. Francis, who's going to be Francis II, is not ready really to be a king. He's going to be so influential. Mary Stuart has total power and control over that boy. Her uncles are, have total control and power over that boy. And then Catherine realizes the importance of like making sure that she's in charge of the family. She becomes the matriarch of the Valois. And was there ever any talk of Catherine remarrying after Henry's death? No, never. She never even entertained that idea. She became queen mother. So she com she completely fulfilled that role of, nah, my duty is to my son. And, and that is it. And a real po political partnership is really with Charles. She has a political partnership with Henry III, but it's a different dynamic. He's much older when he becomes in 1574. He's, um, he's also the favorite. So he gets away with lots of things that he says and does to his mother. But she loves him so much. She tells him, like, you're, you're my everything. It's so touching, the letters they exchange to each other, especially her. But even, even him, he loves her so much. And even when they have massive fallout, they always 
go back together. They always reunite at some point. But it's a different, there is a political partnership, but the real one where she has much more power, where we reveal her right influence on politics is really under Charles' reign, so from 1560 to 1574. Let's bring Elizabeth into this picture. So do we know when Elizabeth and Catherine's paths first crossed? Yes, so it starts quite early on. But first of all, like when when Henry II is going to die, Catherine is already very keen to show that she's a, an important political figure in France. So she's going to send a letter to uh, Elizabeth to thank her for her condolences to the king and to herself, the new king, obviously, Francis II. And she's going to try to show that she's important. But Elizabeth is kind of dismissing her, thinking, you're just a mother of the king. I'm not really interested in you. And it's also she's really annoyed with Francis II and Mary Stuart for using the English coat of arms and the titles and everything. So, so we have a big discussion about this and she's kind of dismissing Catherine. When Francis II dies, she realizes now that Catherine is going to be the one that she has to deal with. And the discussion, the, the, how it's going to start is quite really bad because they're both really... At first, it's complicated. At first, they're scared because they're both annoyed a bit with... They, they have difficult relationship with Mary Stuart. But what happens is that Mary Stuart is obviously a widow. Catherine doesn't want her in France. So she's the one who sent her back to Scotland. She's like, thank you very much. Bye bye, girl. And Mary Stuart is like, please, please let me stay. No, you can't stay. I'll go to Lorraine. No, you won't go to Lorraine. You won't stay with your uncles. You will go back to Scotland and rule Scotland and live this country alone. And, and Mary is, is completely devastated, which shows to me that she's more French and Scottish in her mind and in her education in everything she is. Anyway, and uh, but Mary's uh, now entertaining an idea of a marriage with Don Carlos, who is Philip II's son. And Elizabeth and Catherine are like, what on earth? That can't be happening. And it's the first time they're going to, without talking to each other completely, well, not directly, like they're not going to say like, Mary is our enemy, we have to do this together. You know, it's not that. But in what happens, it's exactly what happened. They realize we can't have, Mary Stuart as, as Don Carlos' wife. So Catherine is going to use her daughter to help convince Philip not to do that. Elizabeth is going to use all the means to try to, you know. And, and so at first you would think, okay, they have like, they've realized that they have things in common. They know that they don't want this third queen to be as important as them, which is interesting as well. But then there's the problem of Calais. Elizabeth wants Calais back and Catherine is determined for that to never happen. And that's the what I call the Queen's War, because it's a political games. They're going to use the ambassadors um, of each other to create pressure. Elizabeth is going to try to use the, the, the instability in France with the Huguenots and the rise of Protestantism and the first civil war in 1562. And Catherine is going to be, oh, do you think I'm stupid? And, and she's like, I'm not stupid. I'm not stupid. I know what you're doing. I know I, I can see what you're doing. And then Catherine is going to change her diplomatic and political game at that time and what i love and spoiler alert the, this first kind of but you need to read about it because it's brilliant how they wrestle against one another uh but catherine is the winner because kelly never i mean it's not a spoiler to be fair everyone knows kelly didn't go back to to the english what i love and what catherine didn't realize at that time is that elizabeth has something that few people have she learns fast when she makes a mistake she learns right away. You throw her a life lesson, she gets it. Same with Thomas Seymour. What happened with Thomas Seymour? Same what happened with her sister. She learns fast, fast, fast. So she made a mistake with Catherine. She realized what happened and she ensured that it would never happen again. And then we have a complicated relationship between the two because then there's peace and they need to go over this and Elizabeth just, you know, has to let go of Calais. So it is, it is, it is, a big issue for her, but she's going to have to do that. And for Catherine, she thinks of a dynasty. She thinks her as a matriarch. She thinks, how can she make, you know, Europe hers? And she said, oh, wait a minute. I have a single queen across the channel. I have three sons. Which one do you want? <laughs> and that's where we have another political game where Elizabeth, you know, are, are playing really. It's such an intriguing and complex relationship, as you say. And it spans 
30 years or more than 30 years. So, of course, it's really difficult for you to you know, tell us all, all about that because it's a big period of time. But could you give us maybe a taste of just some of the other pivotal interactions that the two have over the decades? Maybe one, you know, from later on, perhaps, or something like that, that we can get a sense of this complexity and this this wrestling, as you're saying. I think what's very funny is like, which, which is described in my book, is the third part is called Mothers Know Best. And it's when... Catherine is the one pursuing Elizabeth. She's going to offer her sons multiple times. So she's going to offer Charles in 1564, 65, then in 1569, 66, 69. Then she's going to offer Henry in 1571, 70, 70, 71. Then it's going to be Francis, Duke of Anjou, first of Alençon and then of Anjou. And that's the biggest, you know, uh, proposal. That's the biggest, I mean, they're really pursuing Elizabeth for almost 10 years. And that's so interesting because obviously if you look at the men, because in, in all these chapters, I look at the men, at Charles, Henry, Francis, and what happened, they do play a role that are, that are all very important. But always you have Catherine behind. And what I found so interesting is we talk about how similar they are, right? We talked about the, the way they were raised and the education. One is an orphan, the other one is a bastard, lost a mother. So they have lots in common. They were not born to be queens and they became queen you know like uh, so it's quite amazing but they have a big difference the biggest difference one understood power through motherhood for her you have no power until you're a mother of a king for elizabeth that's an absurd idea because she's a daughter of a king she's queen regnant unlike in france there's no salic law she can rule she is ruling so for her, she sees power through herself. She doesn't have to be a mother of a king, to be powerful. And for Catherine, that idea that a woman wants to be single, refuses to marry, doesn't see the importance of a dynasty, doesn't see the importance of having a son, really drives her crazy. The time she tries to pursue Elizabeth and she tells her, like, you need to do this, you need to do that, it's because she doesn't understand that Elizabeth has a completely different concept of power that is completely like unthinkable for Catherine. So you know when I said that these two women were insecure, you know they, had, they, they were insecure, right? They, they they went through so much, you know, in in their lives. They coped with that in different ways, and that's because also their background is not very much like different. Like one is a princess, the other one is not. So it, it is it is very important. But for Catherine. And she's going to tell Elizabeth this. If you want to protect yourself from the threat of Mary Stuart, you're going to have to marry. And you're going to have to have sons. It's the only way for you to ensure that Mary will never have your throne. For Elizabeth, was it really about this? Or was it about something else, the problem with Mary? You know, was, it, was she scared of her becoming queen after her death? No, I don't think so. I think she didn't like talking about succession because as soon as you talk about successor, as she knew that, again, she learns... She learns fast. She knows with Mary the First. As soon as they were, talks about, oh, Elizabeth is a successor. So she knew that it's the end of the queen. It's the end of the monarch. There are plots. So she, she wanted to avoid this. She didn't manage to because there were plots anyway, right? But I don't think she had a problem with Mary becoming her successor, even though she didn't want to name her as such. But she really had a problem with Mary not recognizing her legitimacy and her queenship <laughs> and having to fight with that, with that idea that she was not the rightful queen of England. I was interested in what you were saying about Catherine's role in Elizabeth's relationship with Mary, Queen of Scots, but also quite fascinated by Catherine's own relationship with Mary, Queen of Scots and how they saw each other. Can you talk a little bit more about that kind of triangular thing happening there? Yes. So what's really brilliant is that obviously we have Elizabeth and Mary, I think everyone has talked about it. You have the brilliant book by Kate Williams, you know, Rival Queens and the Betrayal of Mary, Queen of Scots. So I'm not going to go, I'm not really going to dive in, into that again, because it's, it's what I'm trying to avoid as well. I'm trying to show that there are other queens that are more important or not more important than Mary Stuart, but are as equally important as Mary Stuart, who played important roles in 16th century European politics. And you have, like with Catherine and Mary, a very interesting dynamic relation, because there, there was one. First of all, Mary Stuart. Mary Stuart doesn't have the upbringing that Catherine and Elizabeth had. Yes, she lost her father when she was young as well, but she had a mother who really loved her really loved her. She adored her daughter. Mary de Guise adored Mary Stuart. 
she ad adored her so much that she wanted the best for her. And the best for her was an education in France, nowhere else. Certainly not in Scotland. That's what I don't like as well about these women is the way they viewed Scotland as almost as, you know, second class, you know, country instead of like being an equal to, to these countries, European countries, France, Spain, even England to, to a certain extent at that time. And um, Mary Stuart is sent, she's almost six, to France. And she is treated like royalty. She is raised with Catherine's children. She is praised for her beauty. She's amazing. Everyone loves her. Henry II loves her. He's like, oh my God, you're amazing. She's promised to Francis. She realized that who's going to become Francis II. She realized that she's going to have total control over, over that little boy. Who's completely smitten with her. So what I'm trying to show you here is that we have an, a, a, a woman, a girl, a little girl, who thinks she's amazing. Who's always been told she's amazing. Her future is amazing. She's going to become Queen of France. If Mary I dies, in her head, there's no Elizabeth because Elizabeth is Protestant. You know, they don't recognize Henry VIII's marriage with Anne Boleyn. So she thinks, I'm going to become Queen of France. I'm going to be Queen of Scotland, Queen of France, Queen of, Eng you know, Queen of England, you know, Queen, 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 Queen. She has this mentality and it's not going to be nice to her. It's not really her fault here. It's the way she was raised and treated. Another woman had a lot of influence on Mary Stuart. And that woman was Diane de Poitiers the mistress of Henry II and the arch enemy of Catherine de Medici. You see what I mean by that? I mean, like the woman who's like constantly humiliating her. And they're going to make fun of Catherine de Medici. They're going to be disrespectful at times. The records and the chronicles we have, I mean, are they completely reliable? I mean, it's like we always have primary sources, like primary sources in 16th century. As you know, you're writing books as well, Natalie. Like it's always you know, a bit hard to yes. be 100% sure. But at the same time, we have to take into account what we see and what we read. And I do believe it. I, I can see it. Because I've read so many of their letters, Diane de Poitiers or Mary Stuart's, I can see a glimpse, a big glimpse of their personalities. And I can see that, you know, happening. And I can see Catherine not reacting because she was not in a position of being able to react. Then, obviously, Henry II dies. Mary Stuart's is queen. And she says that, you know, her mother-in-law like trying to have some influence on her husband and she's like well woman that you you know in your place i'm the i'm the wife i'm the one who's going to be in control but she can't avoid that francis ii loves his mother and still going to listen to her like much less than he's going to listen to mary and her uncles but the guises are behind mary as well they're always telling her how amazing she is and and that she's the one who needs to push through things and so the relationship i need you need you need to imagine that Mary has been like a little brat, really. Catherine has struggled. And then Francis dies. Mary's world collapsed. She's no longer Queen of France. She's Queen Dowager of France. Catherine doesn't, and that's why Catherine's like, you can't stay. And I don't know, like there are no letters, but you can imagine, you can like, please, like bear with me. But can you, can't you imagine a scene in a corridor somewhere, in a garden of Catherine and Mary discussing things and Catherine telling Mary, that's the end. You have to go back to Scotland. Now I'm in charge. And you have this orphan from Florence, who lost everything, who has been, you know, ridiculed. People made fun of her. Mary Stuart was one of them, probably. Now you have to go back. However, for Catherine, she's not... Okay, I, I do think she, she's not that resentful because uh, even with Diane de Poitiers, so obviously when, when Henry II dies, Diane de Poitiers is like, it's, you have to, she had to leave the court. Like, it was like, bye-bye, you have to go back. But she's not going to take all her possessions. She's going to take back the most important royal castle that Henry had given Diane, which was Chenonceau, my favorite castle of all time. And she's going to take it back and take it for herself. But she leaves all, all the wealth, everything else, everything else he has given her, she can keep but she can't stay at court. So for Diane de Poitiers, I would say like she got, and actually Diane de Poitiers is going to write a letter to Catherine saying, I apologize for all the humiliations I caused you over the years. I think she, she knew what was, you know, she was hoping, please like don't, don't, don't lose uh, your, your shit on me, please. But, but, but Catherine won't. And with, with Mary, once Mary is in Scotland, Catherine is, does not have, she, she doesn't, I think she doesn't like her, but she doesn't have hard, you know, feelings for Mary. So I think here we have really like a kind of a new dynamic because Catherine is not going to want thing, bad things to happen to Mary, but she doesn't want Mary to be a problem for her. She doesn't have the hard feelings. She doesn't have, she doesn't want Mary to lose her life, but she does want Mary to recognize Elizabeth's you know, legitimacy. And she wants Mary to stop being, because, because it's not about Mary, it's about the Gizzes. 
And she knows what the Guises are trying to do in France and how they create problems in France. And she knows that Mary is related to all of this. But what I'm trying to say is that at the end, when Elizabeth is going to make the decision to have Mary's execution, it's something absolutely appalling for Catherine. And it's when for Catherine, like she sees Elizabeth almost as a monster for doing this. She has she can't believe that Elizabeth went that far. So much I want to ask you, but there's a couple of things that have sort of sprung to mind. So I suppose, in what ways do you think Catherine and Elizabeth's relationship shaped their own dynasties, which you've been talking a little bit about, but also European politics as a whole? And maybe also, if you can tell us a little bit about how you think Catherine and Elizabeth influenced each other as well, maybe in terms of how they ruled? I think they had, like, they were quite similar in terms of, like, the way they saw things. I'm going to give you a, a concrete example of that. Catherine and Charles went on progresses, Catherine was the one, was the first one to understand that if you want to rule over a country, you need your, the people to love you. And for that, you need to be seen, you need to connect with them. So she's going to go on progresses all over France with a nine-year-old boy. Elizabeth is going to go on progresses during her reign and doing the exact same thing. They read the same books. They both read Machiavelli and they probably both, you know, learned from what he was saying, but also dismissed most of it because it's not just about fear. It's not just about that, but they did play the manipulation games. They did play the lying games. It was obviously part of ruling in the 16th century, but they learned as well from Erasmus who wrote the Christian, the education of a Christian prince. And he's very pushing the idea of love between people and a king or monarch, a ruler, because he's saying that as soon as you have fear, then you become a tyrant. If you have love, you're a good prince. And prince at that time is used as a neutral word. It's not, you know, to refer to a man. It's the prince is like a monarch, a ruler. So I think for both Catherine and Elizabeth, they learned that and very early on. And this is how they wanted to influence European politics. This is how they viewed their roles. Obviously, there's also very something very different. It's also, also their religion. One is Protestant, the other one is Catholic. I believe that they were not, they were both quite tolerant for their time. I mean, people will probably disagree with me, especially on Elizabeth, because of what happens after after 1570. And I know it, some stuff happened before that, but I believe that it's more the government policies than it's hers. I think she almost feels like she has no choice to take you know, the country more and more Protestants because of the threat that Catholic countries and Catholicism can cause for her reign. And for Catherine, she's a very strong Catholic. She's, the, I mean, she, she's the niece of a Pope. She's Italian, half Italian, she's half French. Like, yeah, she's very, very, very Catholic. But she understands, they both understand the, the importance of ruling. And for that, it means you need stability and you need to be ruling over everyone, not just the Catholics, not just the Protestants. So this is how they understood European politics. But in a way, they are set in being very big rivals. Because Elizabeth is going to support the Huguenots in France. And Catherine is going to know that they are like some, you know, Catholic priests in France that are probably close to the Guises and others and plotting against Elizabeth. So they are set to be very different. At the same time, when they do influence each other. And what I mean by that, it's not in a direct way. It's more, um, it's subtle. It's a subtle influence. It's the fact that they learn from each other. They learn from how, you know, how the ambassadors also respond to them. So, you know, the report that they're going to read from the different English ambassador or different French ambassadors is going to shape their ideas of each other. What's so funny is that we have a French ambassador. I don't have the name right now, but it's in my book, who, you know, he reflects on on those two women, on those two queens that he's known, that he met in person, both of them. And he thinks that if they had met up in real life, they would have been friends. And it's funny because I think it probably would have been possible because they, they had very, they had massive differences, but they, they did have big similarities. And I think they would have laughed and joked about this. It's also not surprising that Elizabeth did become friends with Francis Duke of Anjou. I think it's friendship that, you know, uh, that was developed, not something romantic. And I think it obviously means that, you know, she probably would have got on well with, with Catherine if there was not so much at stake. You see yeah, what I mean? Yeah, I do. I do. That's intriguing. And, and I have one final question for you, Estelle. And that is, what do you think their lives tell us more generally, I suppose, about women and power in the 16th century? It tells us how fragile it is. It tells us that whatever you do, however you do it, whatever your intentions are, 
you're going to be criticized. You're going to be even more criticized than men. I'm going to give you some examples. Mary Tudor, Mary the First of England, is called Bloody Mary for persecuting Protestants. And I'm not justifying what she did. That's not what I'm saying. Obviously, killing any human being is awful. But Henry II of France has killed more Protestants than Mary. Way, 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 way more. The persecution of Protestants in France was absolutely appalling under Henry II's reign, even under Francis I's reign. I've never heard Bloody Henry as a, as a nickname. So each time that you're a woman, you're going to be criticized. Elizabeth, you know, obviously Elizabeth in many ways, she's been glorified as well because, you know, she's this single woman who's ruled for over 40 years a country. So she has lots, of, she's received lots of love and her reign has created this Elizabethan golden age, this ideal, you know, uh, time, which it was not, obviously, but, you know, she, she created lots of problems. She's the beginning of the empire, which is, Definitely not something that we can be like super, like we can be proud of. The relationship with Ireland did, was also a massive issue. The way she handled it was really not the right way. So what I'm saying is there's a lot of things, you know, that were not to be glorified. Yet her reign is overall glorified. But she's also very vilified when you have a discussion about what happened with Catholics and Catholicism and, and with Mary Stuart and, and with Catherine. She's, there's the black legend of Catherine. Everything that went wrong. It was because of her. And I can tell you that it wasn't. Please read my book. You'll see that it wasn't. She's not responsible for Jeanne d'Albret, so Jeanne, Queen of Navarre's death. She's not responsible for the massacre, the saint Bartholomew's Day massacre. She's not responsible for the civil war. She's not, you know, that type of woman. It's just a black legend that has tamed, you know, her reputation for centuries. And also because it's xenophobia, right? Like there's, there's this thing about her being an Italian. So what we learn is that for women in power, whatever you do, however you do it, you'll be even more criticized because we live in a patriarchal society. It was even more true for them, but it is still true for it's us. It's still true. That's I what mean, I was just thinking. It's still true. It is it? still true. I mean, like the women who are in power are always much more criticized. Or when they're close to becoming in power, you know, like yeah. it's, and here, like I'm I'm thinking of, of Hillary Clinton, you know, for example. Like I'm not thinking of Marine Le Pen, who is not the type of person we want as a ruler so that's you know it's not because you're a woman that you're a good woman you know like that you're going to be a good ruler but what's interesting is that with elizabeth and catherine who really had i believe great intentions regarding their countries the respective countries it's almost as as if they couldn't win right it's almost as if they couldn't win because in the end they were just women and women should not be rulers and it's even more true for Catherine because obviously I think there, there's a real problem for, in France for uh, having a female ruler. So I think that's why also she's much more vilified than Elizabeth was and, and is today. Estelle, I said at the beginning of the episode that I was eagerly awaiting my copy. Now it's even more so. And I encourage everyone, it's Blood, Fire and Gold. What a brilliant title. We can pre-order now, but the book will be out on the 30th of June. So we, we do not have long to wait at all. And I'm so excited. Before I can let you go, I want to ask you for a Tudor takeaway, something for our listeners to go off and have a look at after the episode. Do you have a suggestion for us? I have many. Excellent. It's so hard. Like It's so it's hard. hard to choose. I, I don't know. If you're going to be in the UK, I would really invite you to go to the Mary Rose and to experience you know, that time of history. So it's basically Henry VIII's ship. It's it's a story of, of war. It's a story of rivalry between Henry VIII and Francis I. And I really invite you to go there and to be immersed into this world because even for me, who you know, who doesn't work on Henry VIII per se, well, that might change, who knows, but like for now. And it, it was absolutely a, a, an amazing experience. There's also Hever Castle, mostly because they have the most amazing historians. So Dr. Owen Emerson and Kate McCaffrey, who's equally brilliant. And they bring Hever Castle back to the center of Tudor history and um, look at their profiles, look at their, you know, Instagram pages and stuff. They are, uh, you always have like snips of what's, uh, snippet of what's going on. And, and it's, 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 you're like, you know, behind the curtains and it's, it's marvelous. So that's my two takeaway for, uh, for your listeners. Fantastic. And I, and I wholeheartedly agree with everything you've said. They are brilliant. And the Mary Rose Museum is fantastic as well. So Estelle, thank you so much for once again, coming back on the podcast and talking Tudors with us. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so grateful. 
Well, that brings us to the end of this episode of Talking Tudors. Thank you so much for joining us. I absolutely love to hear from listeners, so if you have any comments or suggestions or just want to say hi, please get in touch with me via my website, www.onthetudortrail.com, where you'll also find show notes for today's episode. If you've enjoyed the show, please share the podcast with friends and family, and don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review. I also invite you to join our Talking Tudors podcast group on Facebook, where you can interact with other Tudor history lovers and hear all the behind-the-scenes news. You'll also find me on Twitter. My handle is on the Tudor Trail and on Instagram as the most happy 78. It's time now for us to re-enter the modern world. As always, I look forward to talking Tudors with you again very soon. Mm-hmm.